So I'm going to cheat just a little bit, but it's okay because this is my show. If you are a regular listener of Nashville Demystified, you know that the conceit is one where I talk with a new Nashvilleian about something that interests them or something that they've noticed about the city. And then I find a longtime Nashvilleian who is presumably an expert on that angle. I talk with them about the same thing. Oh, uh, Nashville Demystified is brought to you by Knack Factory, and we own this town. Knack Factory is a commercial video content and communications firm with offices here in Nashville, and we own this town as a badass collective of podcasts produced right here in the city by people who live here. So the cheat is this. I am today's new Nashvillian. Today, our subject is Robert Altman's Nashville and nine other movies. Nashvillians, new and old, should get to know better. Um, Our guest who's going to cover uh, those subjects is the wonderful Jason Sean, who is a film critic for Nashville Scene. Um, You'll hear more about him shortly. The whole purpose of the format of this show is to reflect my experience here. I'm new to town as of very late February, and I'm incredibly fascinated by the experience and perspectives of folks who are new to a place, Um, you know, selfishly, because that's my reality. But really, it's meant to offer a lens through which I have an excuse to look at Nashville. And the show gives me an excuse to reach out to and to spend time with the interesting people in my new home. And also, I'm sort of a neurotic. (laughs) I really like history. And so, of course, I challenge myself to do weekly homework to better understand this place that I live now. Um, The new Nashvillians on the show are always ultimately a binary for me um, and understanding my experience here. But I have self-assigned as this show's guest because, again, um, it's about the movie Nashville, which is probably my favorite American film. Um, That makes it sound like I'm cultured in all sorts of film, which I am not. I used to be more than I am now, um, but now I'm just a very, very amateur enthusiast. I should say it's my favorite film, period. Uh, Regardless, the 1975 Robert Altman masterpiece is my favorite for so, so many reasons. Um, That, you know, this critic and all-around awesome person, Jason Sean, who we're going to talk with, is going to touch on. But... It's also so lodged into my psyche that I have to consistently remind myself not to bring it up in every interview and every introduction to the show. Um, I'm sort of hoping that covering it uh, will reduce this problem, but it probably won't. We'll dive deeply into what Nashville is in this episode, so please excuse the surface level treatment here. But as someone who makes commercial video, Alvin is a bit of a hero. He used to make commercial farm equipment films, which is sort of funny and really resonant. Um, And that was sort of his film school and his launching point into film. He got into making movies late, which is a bit of a beacon and a blast of optimism for anyone in my position, a commercial video producer who's midway through their career. Uh, And not only did he make movies, uh, he made some of the best movies. He was brash, opinionated, surrounded himself with the coolest people. He partied, who was a bit of a megalomaniacal asshole (laughs) through much of his life. He purportedly mellowed out in his later years. He was anti-authoritarian without being right-wing, which is sort of a big deal these days. And he smoked a ton of pot. He was fucked up in a number of ways and heroic in a number of other ones. So Nashville is at its core about the tension between the coexisting cultures in the city. The very first piece of drama in the film is one in which Haven Hamilton, who's a Porter Wagner-inspired character, says to a long-haired session musician named Frog, cut your hair, you don't belong in Nashville. That's right. You don't belong in Nashville is uttered by one of the main characters of the film in the first five minutes. And people talk about the tension between new and old Nashville as if it's novel, as if it's a new thing. I love it because it's big and sprawling and ridiculous and beautiful. And it could very well or very easily be about political, social, and cultural landscapes of today. The movie is just as much about 2019 America as it is about the America of the bicentennial era. But again, more on that in the episode. Today's guest, like I've said, is Jason Sean. He works at the Bellcourt Theater, which is just amazing, and he writes for National Scene. Here's how I met Jason. 
I went to go see 9 to 5 at the Bell Court, which I was stoked about for good reason. The show was packed and the energy was great. And the only bummer was this. I noticed some programming note uh, that a local film critic would be introducing the film. And I immediately thought, fuck, this is going to be such a joy kill. Um, You know, some know-it-all is going to get up in front of the theater, be inconsiderate of time, suck all the fun out of the room, make for a weird start to the movie. So, like, no thanks. And... You know, the time comes around to see the movie and, and this guy, Jason, gets up in front of the audience and in, in two minutes, like two concise, respectful of the audience time and energy and mental state minutes, this dude just makes the case for why 9 to 5 is a radical and hilarious piece of American cultural and artistic history. And he did so with a sense of strong and certain fervor that left me energized and even more psyched to see the movie than I was when I'd walked through the door. Like, how is that even? impossible um he was just energetic and knowledgeable and funny um you know a a film critic of all things these things uh he was he was all of the above uh so i thought okay this is the man i need to speak with about nashville um i'd been thinking about this episode for a while and it turns out basically everyone who worked on the film and who is accessible is uh, uh either in los angeles or dead and so that brings us to this show um and as just a quick bonus, you know, Jason came on and talked not just about Nashville, but he also talked about nine other movies that he feels are must-sees for fans of both, you know, film and this city. The list is deep and broad, and his commentary on each of his recommendations um, is so much fun. You can find the full list on the website at NashvilleDemystified.com. So before we begin, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. Consider giving a review if you can. Consider sharing with a friend. We're on Instagram and on Twitter uh, at National Demystified. We're on the Dustin Diamond of the Saved by the Bell cast that is Facebook these days. If you have any feedback that you want to send to me directly or ideas for future shows, you can reach me at podcast at knack-factory.com. That's podcast at K-N-A-C-K hyphen factory.com. That silent K kills every time. Uh, And you know, Without further ado, uh, here's Jason. So I I saw you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw you with with past guests of mine, uh, Sarah Marshall, who's a who's a writer <laughs> for the Believer and, and a handful of other publications, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and my girlfriend, who's a who's a local musician and a fiddler. Mm-hmm. Uh, Introduce nine to five. Yes, and and I uh, there are very okay. Let me let me give a a warn not a warning, but let me give some background. If I see that in a movie I'm going to see that is that has some historical um, uh, mm-hmm. oomph, which nine to five does, mm-hmm. and I see that there's a fucking person who's going to introduce the movie Mm -hmm. i'm like oh this is going to be the worst (laughs) and i have never seen two things Mm -hmm. one someone who was assigned to introduce something respect a time limit uh Uh which you did and two bring the same um tone and fervor that the movie brings (laughs) to the introduction and i felt honored as a result Uh of that and i felt invigorated going into that movie in a way i never felt before (laughs) like i'm usually really bad about time limits really but uh, but yeah in that instance i was just sort of like like it's you know the films it's just under two hours Mm. so a lot of times it depends on the length of the film like if it had only been 90 minutes i would have probably gone maybe like a minute longer but But maybe maybe like a minute longer we would have been in three minutes and it would have been awesome but what what what, just quickly before we even jump into what we're jumping Mm -hmm. into you introduced uh nine to five mm-hmm. why is that why is that a movie people need to go see um well i mean for first of all if you're in the state of tennessee any chance you get to pay tribute to our continually best tennessee and dolly parton <laughs> you should you should um it's uh it's a, it's a great film. It's really funny. It's very ahead of its time politically. Like, I mean, it's it's a film that's saying, here's what's wrong with the workplace. Here are things we can do to fix it. And there, there are solutions that seem simple, but yet the corporate world has not learned from it. Mm. Like the daycare center thing. Right. Like, there's no reason why any company with more than 100 employees just like – save yourself the time have an on-site daycare center mm-hmm. and then you know it's it, it just makes good sense to me but but 
I've, I firmly stand by the fact that nine to five is one of like the three best films ever made about the workplace. Mm-hmm. I would put Paul Schrader's Blue Collar mm-hmm. and uh, Alien, the Ridley oh, Scott sure, film. Sure, like sure. all of them are so – they don't mince words and they're not – trying to be cute they're like addressing really serious issues uh with the workplace and what's crazy is that all three of those films are from well okay nine to five was 1980 but it was made in the late 70s Mm -hmm. all three of those films are from the 70s and none of those lessons have really made it into like the current corporate space that we work in which is kind of it's really sad but it also makes you appreciate how far ahead of the game 70s cinema was it's interesting too because it's not um uh, is platitudinous a word? It's it's not it's mm-hmm. not full of platitudes, right? It's, yeah, it it has it has a section dedicated to reforms. Yeah, which, oh, absolutely. Which, which yeah, progressive ideals aren't always good at suggesting. Yeah, yeah, and it's that it's it's great. It's like because you go on, and it's not even until like the last twenty minutes of the film that they really get into like how they managed to turn that company into something different. But it's like every single one of those you could absolutely do, mm-hmm. right. and uh, and it's just fascinating to see. And a, an office building with that many hundreds of employees and no computers, right, like right. that's staggering. Like that's what that's one of the things that I love showing older films uh, to like younger audiences because like people can't even conceive of a workplace with no computers. Right. I mean, Alien at least they can inf- people can key, key into that because there are computers involved. Whereas like the the other films, like it's a, a, a workplace where everyone has a typewriter and a phone, mm-hmm. and it's just it feels like a science fiction film at this point and it's and it's fascinating to see how people react to that yeah it really does it feels like you know in being john malkovich like it feels mm-hmm. like it's like it's like slightly removed from yeah reality. pulling back the veil right. <laughs> on on something that was always there but that you could never contextualize consciously yeah absolutely so mm-hmm. so i i asked you to come in to talk about nashville and mm-hmm. and a quick anecdote um about nashville mm-hmm. uh i i was at an art opening the other night mm-hmm and I talked with a man in his 50s who had an advertising firm. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was talking about having gone to college and, and what I would you – know, 50s or 60s. I mm-hmm. presume I presume that he, he had some exposure to the city in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I have no frame of reference for what the city was like in the 70s outside of some of the scenes mm-hmm. in Robert Altman's Nashville. And mm-hmm. he said, I still hate that movie. Oh God. Okay. Is that, he's, he's got some music industry background then. <laughs> Here's the thing about the film. Robert Altman's Nashville is the best movie ever made about America. <laughs> and it is it is unwilling to like cushion blows. It is unwilling to like make everyone feel good about things. And um it is a staggering achievement and so much of that there is residual hatred towards that film in this but it's almost all coming from people who were in the music industry at that time in the 70s and it's because and it all comes down to one decision and that was Altman had his cast write their own songs hmm. that's it that is why people you, people will act like they have a real reason to be angry about it no it's because they feel like it, it doesn't show the city at its best when you don't use the, the songwriting talent that we have hmm. and which is so ridiculously petty like to have a vision of America that's that I mean 27 speaking parts everyone comes across the songs are good yeah. like it's, it's the idea that like there was this there's a certain dishonesty at the heart of it and that's why people retain this anger towards it I I don't understand it and I'll I'll tell you something the one there are a lot of things about the new Nashville that bother me I mean like we're losing so many of our historic buildings the traffic is like it might as well be LA at this point as far as the traffic is but there's there's an appreciation for that film. Mm-hmm. People who are moving here now, if they know that movie, it's not of, you know, oh, well, songwriters. It's a case of they know that as like a legendary work of American cinema from mm-hmm. the 70s. And it deserves that. It deserves to be like a reason why people are interested in this city. Like whenever you have film critics uh, come into town, I always have to take them on the Altman tour. Yeah. Whenever people just from Europe in general, whenever they're in town, they they want to see the Parthenon. You know, they want to see the exit in. The, whatever places are left from that film, it's it it has a very 
what's the word I'm looking for? There's a spiritual magnetism to that film that a lot of people the world over really respond to. People who may not even necessarily care about country music, but who just care about like a politically egalitarian vision of like a country that like you can never make everyone agree on something, but that respects that many different points of view. And it's just, it's such an amazing achievement. It's what Altman pretty much was doing his whole career. And it, the, the moment when everything came together is Nashville. Yeah. And I want to, I want to talk about what you mean when you say that that's a film about America and I'm Mm -hmm. sure that this ties into it, but what I'm struck by with that movie Mm -hmm. is a tension I still see clear as day today, mm-hmm. which is you have, um, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's the, the Hamilton character? Haven Hamilton, have, Henry Gibson right. from laugh yeah. 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 You have Henry Gibson who's playing Haven Hamilton. And within the first five minutes of that movie, he says to one of his session, session musicians, who I think is frog in that movie, mm-hmm. yeah. he says, uh, cut your hair. You don't belong in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Like that movie's about attention about mm-hmm. who belongs in a place and who doesn't belong. Oh, absolutely. Place. Well, and that's, and that's part of the people who still hate the film who are around then. You know, that, that they had people writing songs who had no business doing that. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of, of trespass to it. And some people can just like, you know, it's, you're getting at a great for truth, greater truth, that's fine. And some people are like, you should never have been doing that to begin with. And the grudge is still there. But I mean, and this is like, and I am not one of those people who's just like the always die out and all that stuff. But it's just like that you will find that the, the people who intrinsically hate that film – they're they're either dying out or they're getting quieter about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what you know what he said that was interesting, and I don't know his tie to music, but I mm-hmm. I assume that there probably was some some tie there. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, you know, that that movie was a that movie was an interesting or sort of an off kilter spoof about what was happening here at the time, and people didn't realize it was a spoof. And my response, and mm-hmm. this is why I'm terrible at networking, uh-huh. right? Like, because my response was. I thought it was about 19 narcissists, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and, and Nashville's always been about narcissists to a certain extent. Right. And And he was like, yeah, (laughs) well, (laughs) and, and not, I mean, that movie wasn't about like everyday Nashvillians. That movie was like about people who came here and people who's into the, Mm whose, whose work and industry was here Mm -hmm. and about their microcosm within sort of a larger city. No, that's very perceptive. And the thing about this city, and one of the things that I feel has been leading to what we call the new Nashville now is that a lot of people that you run into, and this is, let me, let me find the delicate way of putting this. (laughs) Um, a lot of them come from, they were really big in the music industry in New York and LA in the late seventies, eighties, maybe even the early nineties. Like I like to, the thing about Nashville now is that it's been so entrenched through the, the country and gospel industries for so long that it is, it's where that the music industry like took hold and, um, you know, in the late nineties with like Napster and stuff as like the traditions of the music industry started collapsing and, you know, like eventually it's sort of like hanging on with streaming and vinyl at this point. But, the thing is Nashville, because it's been so entrenched for so long, you can have been you can have been a big fish in New York and LA back in the day. And even though that you don't really have that cachet there, you can come here mm. and game recognize game. Right. So you find a lot of people who, from the music industry back in those respective decades have come here because they can still get some respect for that. And, you know, like finding new ways and it's, it's fascinating, but it's just like, you know, I don't want to say it all comes back to music industry scum, uh, but there's a lot of that. <laughs> there's a, you can't escape it here. And it's one of the few cities where that's like retained some cachet. Right. And the, you know, I mean, I would, I would argue in, and I'm, I'm, my, my memory is horrible for remembering character names, mm-hmm. but, but the, um, uh, uh, Shelley Duvall's uncle in that uh-huh. movie, the guy, yes. the guy who ends up housing her, he, I mean, he is the most sort of salt of the earth, earth Nashvillian mm-hmm. in that movie. And he's probably the most sympathetic character as a result. Uh-huh. Like the person who's most removed from. But he's also like, and they don't get into this specifically, but I mean like his house is on 16th or 17th. Right. And like, even then, you know, that's a music row house. Right. So that's like, there's money there. They yeah, take yeah. in borders because yeah. they, they take in, you know, the, the assassin, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. but that, that house is a signifier right. that, oh. um, that there's, there's money there, but they never address that. Right. He's 
and like an Airbnb. Yeah, basically, yeah. you know, in the seventies, and that's yeah. that's the thing. <laughs> that's like one of those. There are all sorts of aspects of that film that are, you know, Altman was a genius at like taking what was there and knowing that every detail tells a story mm. that you don't even necessarily have to address on screen, mm. but like. If you're if you're watching the film if with your eyes open you you pick up on these little details, yeah. and um, it's a you know it's such a such a staggering achievement that it's to to find that much depth and texture with all of these different people, um, and to keep it juggling right because like I mean there you know there's that like famous apocryphal story that he had talked about one time it was going to be two different films it's going to be Nashville Red and Nashville Blue because they shot so much, but I don't know if I mean I would love to see that obviously you know I want show me everything that was involved with that but at the same time it's so perfectly balanced that I don't I don't I don't know if it could retain that I don't know if it would be as an amazing experience as an enduring as enduring an experience if it was expanded and could like sprawl out like that because like the the key to Altman the, like the thing that defines his work is there's this tension between um between sprawl and um, conciseness, that's not a word, um, uh, focus. Mm. And it's that, that fine, working that tension. It's like every single one of his films, it's like a symphony for like 150 different instruments. And, um, you know, and when it didn't work, and Lord knows we've all had our noble failures and so did he, but God, when he was at the top of his game, there's there was nobody better. Yeah. And, and Prairie Home Companion, his very last film, is the same way. Mm. Like, I mean, and especially to start with the framework of like, oh, you know, you're going to follow Garrison Keillor's lead and you're just like, mm. but it still works because everyone in it is allowed these moments and he, they find that perfect balance of elements in there. And like, like I, you know, it's, 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 it's an issue these days, but like I was after, – after I saw that film, I was just like, perhaps I've been under-evaluating Garrison Keillor all along. And then, you know, like we find out the story behind the scene and just like <laughs> – but it's still – it's an amazing film. Sure. Well, I mean he does a great job. I mean he, he, does, a, he does a phenomenal job taking a world mm -hmm. and, then, and then occupying that world and sort of mm -hmm. like – and representing it in a way that gives it texture that it might not have had. And as a viewer – making you feel like you belong there. Mm. You never feel like you're trespassing in an Altman film, which is why it's so ironic that the people who still hate Nashville mm -hmm. view it as like, oh, well, they shouldn't have been here as a form of trespass then. Mm. Whereas like there's nobody more egalitarian in American cinema than Robert Altman. How, okay, so let's back up. We mm -hmm. went sort of ass over. Altman Sorry. On this. No, it's not your fault. <laughs> I was like, the second you got in here, I was like, let's get into it. But the, um, how... What is what is Nashville and who is Robert Altman? <laughs> um, Robert Altman, um, he sadly he is no longer with us. He's one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Uh, he started out in the fifties directing TV, um, and you know moved into directing features. He did quite a few. I mean, like it's and it, one of his, the the the. I, I wouldn't call it the trademark because it's not in necessarily every one of them, but I mean. Um, he became famous for, you know, large casts, um, multi-track sound, like like using very meticulous sound design, miking each actor individually. So, you know, you'd have like 30, 40 audio tracks and like mixing back and forth between that. And just all about finding a balance and like creating a mood and a space and just sort of throwing you into it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's one of the best. And, and uh, what in in what is he in? I mean, he obviously directed Nashville, but like, uh -huh. what what is what is Nashville as a movie? Um, Nashville is a 1975 film that um, deals with uh, the rise of a political candidate named um, Oh God, what is Hal. his Hal um, Ah, what is his name? It's uh. Hal Philip Walker, um, yeah, who actually appears in a later Altman film called O.C. and Stiggs from mm -hmm. the 80s, which was his anti-teen film, which is – it's not impossible to find, but it's really hard to find. And it is very much an acquired taste, but if you ever want to see him just filled with bilious contempt for, um, <laughs> for like – rich teens like just destroying everyone around them ocean stigs is what we're checking out but uh, it's it's loosely it's structured around uh how philip walker who is running for president 
uh, as part of the replacement party, um, as well as um, the attempted comeback of a country legend named Barbara Jean, played by Ronnie Blakely, whom, if you don't know this film, you probably know her as Nancy's mom in A Nightmare on Elm Street 1. Um, one of the Ronnie Blakely, one of the most amazing, unconventional country voices out there. And sang on, uh, on Leonard Cohen's Death of a Lady's Man. Yes, she did. <laughs> yes, she did. And that, I mean, talk about a talk about a drama laid out right there. And she's also on a Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder review. Oh, yeah. And um, so it, she, she's in Ronaldo and Clara, and hopefully in the, the new Scorsese documentary about the Rolling Thunder review that we'll get some good um, Ronnie Blakely footage because she's incredible. But anyways, the, her character Barbara Jean had been in an institution and had some breakdowns and was like about to make a comeback, and so they find this way like, well, we'll have Barbara Jean perform at the Hal Philip Walker rally at the Parthenon, and um, the, the whole thing happens over the course of about three days. Um, lots of music drama, lots of musical performances, um, people who are famous and want to stay that way, people who are famous and just want to recover from it and like find a new way of living, people who desperately want to be famous. It's all about, it's very much like Nashville is the Robert Altman film that is the only Robert Altman film that could have been a John Waters film as well, because it's all about fame and how you deal with that and how you process it and how you live in a town that where like f- fame is the closest thing to public transit in the city in the seventies, mm. um, and that's still a thing to a certain extent. You know, it's a it's a it's a weird and wild film. The, the tagline for it was the damnedest thing you ever saw, <laughs> which is great. Um, and it was like that they would promote it in the same way that the opening credits are done, which are like a KTEL compilation of mm-hmm. like it's the biggest hits of Nashville, you know, and just it. Um, it's a fascinating approach to uh, celebrity culture um, and, you know, how we view art and how we rank different kinds of art in the, in the way that people interact. And it's um, it's just one of those films that it always sticks in the back of my mind. Like you, you never get past it because it's – there's nothing else quite like it. Yeah. And like – I mean I guess like so many movies made by perceptive – filmmakers like it was a real me too movie too before before oh yeah no it's it's very much aware of like how well i mean altman um at that point in the 70s he was really into um like a lot of his films their elements are improvised or uh, or developed over time but um his approach with nashville was uh, joan tewksbury who is the credited screenwriter um they had worked on several projects and he was like hey i want to do something about country music in nashville you know here's several thousand dollars Go to Nashville, spend some time there, meet some people, start putting an outline together of of the people that you think should be part of this, the stories you hear, that sort of thing. So she came down and spent several months just like, you know, listening and hanging out and going to shows and develop the outline that like when when Altman moved in and started casting that they built this film around um and he's he's al- he was always very conscious of um of women's voices mm. um and and with Nashville again because like you know the music industry is built on on image and um and youth you know there there's there's more than enough to go around yeah. so you have you know like these you have like these sainted um figures of country music who are defiantly not sexualized, who are like, you know, mama and daddy music. Uh, whereas, and, but then you also have like, you know, sultry new country. And then, so, and you have, uh, the character Celine Gay, mm. who is a, a, um, a coffee shop waitress at the airport mm-hmm. who, who wants nothing more than to be famous. And she's just not very good and ends up, you know, getting pulled into a, a strip number just because she thinks it's going to be her big break. Right. And, um, which, you know, and there's, that's no opprobrium towards, you know, find your way in however you want to, but she just was, she was deceived. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the key is that like, that's, that's the indictment of Nashville is that like, you know, that, that, that pathway to fame will be in front of you but they never tell you what you're going to have to do to right. get there. Right. And not only is she de- she deceived, I found like one of the most heartbreaking pieces of that whole – of her whole arc mm-hmm. is even when it's presented to her that she's deceived. Yeah. She's like – she realized – she's like, well, it was in the pursuit of, of, of fame. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you can tell that she'll probably be deceived again. Yeah. Yeah. And even, even along the lines of Barbara Jean, you brought up like mm-hmm. – her the, her the stripping of her sexuality in that movie mm-hmm. in one way or another to preserve her as sort of like mama and daddy music yeah. is 
is itself like um there's like you know her 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 husband who's who's sort of he's her manager running around cheating on her right right, right. <laughs> exactly and what's funny is like it's it's another reason why Ronnie Blakely is such an incredible actress who doesn't get near enough credit she did get nominated for uh, best supporting actress Oscar it didn't win so Lily Tomlin got nominated as well from the film mm. uh, but like if you listen to Ronnie Blakely's albums they are defiantly sensual I mean like they're like they're like Kate Bush level of like like really not, I don't want to say tawdry metaphors but like it, you know a little hot under the collar I mean like really there's a lot of that kind of feeling there so like for her to pull off Barbara Jean as this like completely different icon of like sainted motherhood is is really an achievement yeah. Um, I, I, I advise anyone who's listening to this, seek out Ronnie Blakely's first two albums because they are essential. Mm. You said, you know, and you, you have proximity, uh, uh, to the Bellacor and so you have mm-hmm. proximity to these, to, to, you know, nights that are devoted to these sorts of movies. Mm-hmm. You said that you run into, uh, folks who are part of the filming of that movie. Can you just talk mm-hmm. a bit about like how that movie was put together and, and, and what that must've been like here in the city? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a huge deal that, that like a major Hollywood film from Robert Altman, who at this point, I mean, he was still, this is four years later, but he still got mad. Mm -hmm. You know, like he'd made several amazing films in between them, but like MASH was such a massive hit that everybody was aware of it. So, um, so they were just like the big deal Hollywood director was coming here and making a movie about country music. Like people were, were very intrigued by that. And, um, so there are several sequences, one at, at Opryland, which is now Opry Mills Mall, which is no longer, which is just not very special. Mm -hmm. But for a time it was a theme park called Opry. Land and there's um, there's a sequence where Barbara Jean performs there on the showboat, which was an actual steamboat that they had like m- mounted in front of an amphitheater where they put on shows um, and countless shows a day. It was great stuff. So you know they would they would have crowds for that. They needed uh, background extras, you know, to just be part of the audiences for these. Um, and then the, the climactic rally at the end at the Parthenon. I mean, they needed hundreds and hundreds of people for this i know that i know they gave like i, th- I think i want to think it was like five dollars and like uh like free sandwiches a hot dog that hot dogs yeah, okay there yeah was that, there was in the, the east nashville newspaper that came out they interviewed uh, steve Rell and he said oh yeah because he's one of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is that's awesome that's yeah. like but yeah so there's there are these several instances where like they're and and the thing about nashville even to this day is that like as far as musical performance, there can be like somebody, you know, like busking for like two people on the sidewalk to like, you know, intimate like dive bars to, um, you know, all the way up to like arenas and stuff. So there's you, and you have to find a way to sort of like show that in films without dwelling on it or spelling it out for people because Altman never, ever, ever about spelling things out for people. Um, so yeah, there were, there were several instances where they needed lots and lots of people in the background and, you know, anybody who could, um, they did. So, which is kind of awesome. And then, and then there are church sequences. There's an amazing sequence where it cuts between like four different Mm -hmm. worship services on a Sunday morning. Each, each one, the crowd is completely different. How they're dressed is different. What the music is, is completely different. And yet it does this amazing job of like giving you this sort of, glimpse into you know you couldn't have done that really in new york or la at the time um and yes some of it is performative like but some of it comes from a deeply sincere place Mm. and that that's the sort of the the tension that that altman always excelled at was like finding the balance between you know what sunday morning performances are like versus sunday morning performances where you're actually you know like singing your heart out versus where you're just there to be seen right and the 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 i was just reminded of the opening scene Mm -hmm. which contrasts um you know hamilton recording a record it's a very sort of stayed he Mm -hmm. was he fashioned after porter wagner yeah yeah there's there's his performance and then Mm -hmm. you have lily tomlin who is the only white member of a (laughs) baptist uh uh, choir Mm -hmm. um and there's they have like sort of like a soul performance performance and there it's mm-hmm. the, it's the back and forth between those two and i was yes. just reminded of that by watching amazing grace yes you know which is, which a, is incredible a, which yeah beautiful you know 1971 performance of aretha franklin in a mm-hmm. in a in a los angeles i mm-hmm. think yeah. uh, based uh baptist uh baptist church and 
there are a handful of times when you see white staff mm-hmm. in that in that performance, like yeah. sort of trying to clap along, and you're like, yeah. you're like, it like it reminds me very much of sort of like the contrast between not mm-hmm. just like not just like you know cultures, uh-huh. but the contrast of sort of like how races occupy different. Oh, absolutely, occupy a geography. Absolutely, and what's fascinating about that compared with the later sequences that that opening, because it's about recording. Mm. It's, you know, it's about capturing a very specific mood, whereas in, when it's the g- cutting between the four worship services, um, it's, you know, it is about the moment. Mm-hmm. And um, it's coming from the, each one of the performances is coming from a very different place. Yeah. And, and I think that's fascinating because, like, that, that's the lesson of the opening scene is that, like, what you're doing and what you're doing for the, for, to be recorded, to be filmed – to be experienced later in different formats are two very different experiences. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, that's like, that's the, one of the subtexts of the film, like just right there is that like, you know, what you're doing and, and the, the, the whole idea in the, in the final, um, rally sequence after the assassination, um, you know, when, um, what, Abilene? No, it's not Abilene, but the, um, Oh God, Barbara Harris, yeah. when her character, when she starts singing, it, it don't worry me. It's like the implication is that like she's becoming the voice that's guiding people past this moment of horror and into something new. But at the same time, you know, this is this is the moment like we don't know what's going to happen when the industry has to record it. And Mm -hmm. can can you take a, a moment of that emotional nakedness and turn it into something that you can use to get your point out to others? Right, right, right. So. So I'm going to ask you, uh, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, I, the, I am sure mm-hmm. that you and me could talk about Nashville forever oh, because yeah. it can be talked about forever. Because it's and awesome. I, and yeah. I've done it. <laughs> You've done it too. <laughs> but, and you have some movies that we're going to talk about that give, an, give another view about Nashville. But can I just mm-hmm. ask you what mm-hmm. your history in the city is and, and, and how you feel about it? Um, I grew up in this area. I mean, I grew up in Mount Juliet mm-hmm. um, from when I was five years old till uh well, I mean, until I went away to college. I did my undergrad at NYU. But um, uh, for starting with junior high, I started going to school at university school here in downtown Nashville. Um, and I was commuting from Mount Juliet to there. So I, I got a feel for, like, Nashville proper and then, like, you know, the surrounding environs. And, like, Mount Juliet now is, like, it's, like, it's corporate suburb everything. I mean, like, I don't even recognize it anymore. And it's, like, it's... You know, it's sad, but, you know, progress is like that and stuff. But I've, I've been aware of, you know, Nashville proper since 1986. Mm. And, um, you know, I moved back here after I graduated because, like, I was like, well, if I'm going to be poor, I'm going to do it where I've got my family and friends rather than <laughs> go further into debt in New York. And I still love New York. I go back every year. Um, you know, it's very it's very dear to me and dear to my heart. But, you know, I'm always going to be a Tennessean. I'm always going to be a Nashvilleian. Um, which is one of the reasons why I tend to get really, really angry about some things that have changed with um, the the quote unquote new Nashville. I'm making sarcastic air quotes <laughs> for the listeners at home, uh, you know, because it's like there's the 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 like yeah, traffic gets bad. I don't care about the traffic. It bothers me how there's no affordable housing in the city, and like that didn't used to be the thing. It used to be that like you could live an interesting bohemian lifestyle around the edges here, mm-hmm. and that's how like all the great songwriters came up in the you know sixties and seventies. Um, Chris Christopherson, Willie Nelson, they've all got stories about that about the time like bumming around Nashville, um, but. Uh, but you know there 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 are some good things that are happening here. You know we there are vegan restaurants. You know we get synth pop shows. Yeah, yeah. We didn't used to get synth pop shows here, but um, you know so it's every city has growing pains. It's just sort of like I wish I wish it weren't so under the thumb of the deeply corrupt and backward thinking Tennessee state legislature because mm. it's like every time they they can they just sort of like oh well Nashville's getting a little bit too progressive we got to stop that and it's just like you really have other things to worry about in your own community but that's that's me telling tales out of church <laughs> uh, shame on me for that but um you know it's like it's Nashville, the film to me, like no matter how much things change, there are truths in that film that that could resonate for anybody, like no matter where you're from. But 
it means more to me from here. Mm. Uh, there's there are aspects of it that just like really like stick out. Like you know, be, going to school growing up, you know, I would I would you know there would be like country music people like I'd like with their kids or grandkids. Like those are my friends. Those are the people I grew up with. So there was always there's always been this sort of like not tangential not. Th- Tactile. It's it's within reach. Mm -hmm. Like you're aware of these, like of like fame and stuff, and like opulence. Is like it's something that's within reach. Not in that you know it's something everyone strives for, but it's just you know it's just something that's there, and it makes for some interesting people. You know, but I mean that's the thing. That's the thing about Nashville. Is like even even today, it's still true. There's lots of interesting people here. When you say when you said at the front the front end of this that that Nashville is a movie about America, mm-hmm. how do you mean that? Um, there's there's so many different points of view, so many different power struggles, so many different ways that people um, lie to one another, so many different ways that people tell the truth to one another, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's stratified, and yet you know like we. We have like the business angle of things. We have spiritual discourse. We have, you know, like families trying to reunite from all over the place. It's just there's, you know, it didn't have to be in Nashville. You could have made the same film anywhere in the world and found like specific things that were distinctive about it. But they made it here. And you know, there was there were thoughts at the time, you know, like they call it Nashville the Third Coast, which I think is kind of cute and deluded. But <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I love the city. I do. Like I've, I've been here for so long. I've been part of it. And, you know, that gives me total license to talk shit if I need to. And sometimes talking shit is the is the most noble form of discourse if that's the only thing people will listen to. Um, but there's, it's impossible. Like when people ask me, you know, just like the films that are, there are films that are about America explicitly, but like Nashville is the one that like, you can show that film to someone and it doesn't matter who they are or where they come from or what they're about. Someone is going to resonate on a level that speaks very profoundly to them. And that's the, that's one of the reasons why the film is so amazing is because every person in it resonates profoundly Mm. and it's it's just sort of like just by being about you know this political rally and you know getting respect and coming back after a time away and not disgrace but in like medical collapse um you know there's at that point in time this was post watergate this was like you know everyone was sort of like i don't want to say dead man's float but like you know just sort of like treading water just sort of like you know what's going on and this movie is just like you know what there's there's a way that it all fits together and it's not a jigsaw puzzle it's not like edges that snap together and like oh we've accomplished this um you know it's bodies of water like flowing in and around each other reshaping the land itself and it's like all these personalities and how it all fits together and it's i i just I don't know of any other movie that does that. Yeah. There, I mean, there are some who've tried. Lord knows there are some that have tried, but like this is, this is the one. And the, and every other one that tries, you know, will 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 fess up to like, no, no, we're trying to make a Robert Altman film. Right. But nobody ever fesses up to trying to make another Nashville because they know they're going to fail. Yeah. Well, it's you, certainly the standard bearer for uh, for ensemble movies. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Even, even like I know this is like we're talking about Nashville and, and cinema. Uh-huh. But I mean, even like Endgame. Like oh, absolutely, if absolutely. You have to tell the story of twenty plus people. Yeah. In, in three hours, mm-hmm. your standard is Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And Nashville does it in less than two and a half. It's like, no, I'm sorry. It's exactly two hours and a half. So, mm-hmm. so, you know, respect. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 um, you, and, and I mean, oh God, if you, even if you think about the fact that, um, you know, it's pretty easy to create a Buzzfeed, mm-hmm. uh, a quiz about like which character from sex in the city are you or which mm-hmm. Ninja Turtle are you? Uh, because they're, you know, they're the Furies, whatever the four, the yeah. four but like with Nashville, Nashville's almost unsettling in how many people who are net 
unlikable slash net likable mm-hmm. you see yourself in. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I pity, I pity the poor soul that would have to try and write that quiz. Right. Because I mean, like with 27 potential outcomes, exactly. like they're just getting, that's, that is just a, that is a, a, a short walk towards insanity. Yeah, that's true. So, so you have, you have some, uh, I'm not going to say homework, but you have, <laughs> um, you have some other movies that like, you know, you're yeah. a person who's into Nashville. Uh, you're a person who's into the city. Mm-hmm. You want to you want to maybe understand the city a bit more, or at least just see it through another mm-hmm. another person's eyes. Oh yeah. Um, can you can you walk us through some of what you have? Yeah. Here? Oh yeah. I, I just I was just brainstorming about like the ten films that like sort of that express what Nashville is. And then one extra one, which it doesn't ex- necessarily express what Nashville is, but it explains something, which is 101, which is the D.A. Pennebaker documentary about Depeche Mode. Oh. Like Nashville is only in it for about 30 seconds. Mm. There's footage of their show at Starwood Amphitheater from 1988, tragically underattended, mm. tragically. And it's used as like this punctuation of like the uneven nature of the road and all that. But because of that, that's why we never got synth pop shows in this city for 30 years. Like it's just really? recently that we finally started getting those again. And it's oh. because like this city let Depeche Mode down and DA Pennebaker, DA Pennebaker caught it on film. Oh my God. And it's it's if you ever get a chance to see it. And also if anybody from Venus Note is listening, get your theatrical rights straightened out because there's so many people who want to show this film. But it's like it's one of those that like, you know, anytime you've got extensive music thing, getting the rights right. for theatrical performance. Oh, it's a nightmare. That's like the, you'd think the industry could make that work, but no. Um, but yeah, no. I just I just came up with like ten films that, um, you know, like Nashville is number one. Obviously, sure. it's there's there's nothing else quite like it. But I was just sort of like, you know, let's let's come up with some other things. Uh, number ten is Trash Humpers mm-hmm. from uh, from to this point still like the the major a tour that to come out of Nashville is Harmony Corinne. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's like it's not explicitly stated as yeah. Nashville, but it is. Sure. It was made here, and it's great because it's the uh, I got to see the 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 U.S. premiere of that at the New York Film Festival, and um, it was amazing because it made Nashville seem dangerous. <laughs> and like, this is like, this is like the press core for the New York film festival. These are like people who don't bat an eye at like art films where like the only thing that changes is the direction of the cigarette smoke mm-hmm. in a three minute long take, you know? And I love that. I love that kind of art cinema, but like these people and they were genuinely unnerved and freaked out by it. And I, so I, I will always respect that film. I don't know if I love it. I don't know if I even enjoy it really. <laughs> But um, it's, you know, and there was a time when I was convinced that they had set my backyard on fire and filming it. It's a long story. Yeah. But um, it's if you live in West Nashville, there's there you got a connection to Harmony, whether you want it or not. And he's <laughs> he's great. I mean, his films are incredible. And I'm glad that we have such a contrarian singular voice that came out of the city and is like unleashing films all over the world. Yeah. And then uh, number nine is The Thing Called Love, mm-hmm. which um, people who watch the TV show Nashville, they know the Bluebird Cafe. Well, Thing Called Love did that in the 90s. It's uh, Keanu Reeves and Samantha Mathis. Peter Bogdanovich, who did The Last Picture Show, made it. And it's fascinating because it is a great time capsule for early 90s Nashville. Mm-hmm. It's not a great film, but its heart is there. Yeah. And, and and Bogdanovich is definitely, he loves to like like get as much as he can of a scene in there. So it's like, and it's, it's readily available. It's never gone out of print or anything. And, um, and I'm sure if you go down to the bluebird, they'll tell you all about it. Uh, number eight is the trouble with Gerald. Um, which is, uh, there's a local filmmaker named Matt Riddle Hoover who, um, you know, every few years he comes out with a new one. Um, uh, subtle films. Uh, this one's a comedy about, um, uh, using crystal healing to like undo all the like, wealth damage that came from growing up in a rich family where people didn't talk, but it's, it's a really, really sweet little romantic comedy. Um, and uh, it's, it's one of those that like, it, it gets at, um, what I was talking about earlier with like, you know, the opulence and like fame being something because you've grown up around them and it's all like, you know, two doors down or whatever. It's not a pressing thing to like pull yourself in like, uh, grabbing hold of fame and not letting go till it thunders. It's just, it's a really sweet little film. I think it's on Amazon Prime, actually. All right, number seven is Songwriter, which is one of my 10 favorite films of all time. It may 
even I may even love it more than Nashville, but I can't put it any higher on the list because like it doesn't even it's scenes in Nashville were actually in Austin mm. dressed to look like Nashville. So, you know, you can't got it. You, you, the line must be drawn in here. Um, <laughs> but songwriter is amazing because it's Willie Nelson and Chris Christopherson and Rip Torn and Melinda Dillon right. and Leslie Ann Warren. It's the best movie about country music ever made. Like Nashville is beyond country music. Songwriter is specifically about country music. It's about the Willie Nelson's time as a tax uh, exile you know, like trying to like come up with the money to pay back tax bills and dealing with ex-wives and stuff. It is absolutely wonderful. It is, it's filthy, it's hysterical, and it's, um, it's finally out on Blu-ray thanks to, uh, the people at Mill Creek. But I mean, it's just like, it's, it's the one that like, you know, Nashville is a heavy movie. Um, and you know, it's unwieldy. Songwriter is like just over an hour and a half it is hysterically funny. You could throw that on in any tour bus or in any dive bar and it would play. Is it nonfiction? Uh, well, it's sort of... Fictionalized? It's fictionalized. Like, I mean, his the, the screenplay is by Bud Shrake, who was Willie's business manager during the, the dark years. Okay. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of truth to it, too. But it's great. And there are moments when, like, Nelson and Christofferson together, I mean, it's like, it's like Samuel Beckett at some <laughs> point. There's like, they're hitting on some, like, absurdist genius with that film. And I can't the, the the biggest compliment that I've ever gotten as a film critic was I wrote about it for the scene when the Belcourt was showing it a couple years back. And I got an email from Chris Christopherson's wife who was just like, oh, yeah, we just saw this in Vienna. He's getting ready to do a show. But like it made him smile at breakfast. And I was oh. like, I made Chris Christopherson smile. That's going on the the, the resume. Yeah, it's like, yeah, done. Like yeah. At that point, yeah, I was photo elf for Chris. <laughs> I was photo elf for Crispin Glover a few times. But I made Crispin. I made, but I made Chris Christopherson smile oh. at breakfast. <laughs> Um, number six. We just get Harmony yeah. to respond. We're in good well, yeah, well, that, no, I mean, we talk, we talk. Like, oh, really, I, I, really? I, he's in Miami now, yeah, yeah. but like, whenever he was in town before, like, he would always like program some amazing stuff at the Bell Court. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's because of him that I got to see John Cassavetti's husbands oh, right in the theater. I got to see Jean Eustache's The Mother and the Horror. Yeah. Like he, the thing about Harmony is that he has impeccable taste, and he is a person who can reach out to the French consulate sure. and get prints of things. Things that other people in this country cannot. Sure. So yeah, the I respect. A, I was a I was a kid when kids came out. I was twelve, uh -huh. and that was. I feel like that was like the warp whistle, you mm -hmm. know, for me. Like once that was handed to me, I was like, oh, yeah. Like somebody gets it. And yeah, it's not anyone I've ever been exposed. <laughs> yeah, to. the combination of <laughs> Harmony and Larry Clark oh, God, yeah. is a whoo. Yeah, I ended watch up out. falling into an interesting rabbit hole with all the people surrounding <laughs> that. We'll talk about that at some point. Please, please keep going. Uh, so for number six is a new film called The Dead Center that it hasn't come out yet, uh, but it is. Absolutely, it's it's a it's a horror film, and it is magnificent. It is so perfectly made. Um, and what's interesting about it is that Nashville plays Atlanta in some parts of it, which is you know usually you'll get other places playing Nashville. Right. But here's here's an instance of like you know down to the downtown office buildings playing like Fulton County such and such. And I'm like that's not Fulton <laughs> County. Don't even kid yourself. But it's great. It's um it stars uh, Shane Carruth from uh, Primer and Upstream Color, and it's a it's like it's a it's a it's a chaotic potential end of civilization film. Some say zombies, some say demons. Um, it's just it's magnificent. The acting is incredible, <laughs> and it's uh, the director Billy Sinise. Um, I this I don't know what its release stat. I don't know what its release plan is going to be, but it's. I got to see it at the Chattanooga Film Festival a couple months ago, and I was just like, "Well, this is Nashville stepping up its game for horror," because yeah. that was always a genre that was like not really there. I mean, like there, there, you know, music dramas, sure, documentaries, absolutely, but like you know, there were some things that you did not associate the city with comedy and horror, and right. this, this is like this horror film is great, and um, I can't wait for people to get a chance to see it. Number five is uh, Musica Campesina, or literally country music. Uh, a Chilean director named Alberto Fuget was in town, like, I guess five or six years ago now, um, you know, just like working on a film, shooting that. And it's it's a great film about, like, the international perceptions in relation to country music. But what it's also amazing for is 
as a, a preservation of like a lot. I, I live in the nations. I live on the west side. And it's been hit by gentrification in a really devastating but also really haphazard way. Mm. And Musica Campesina documents all of these spaces, these like communal houses and stuff that just they're not there anymore. They got torn down. They got tall, skinny sliver buildings replacing them. Um, and it's just it's and it's weird to speak in that kind of wistful tone about something that was only three or four years ago. But it's like the geographic makeup of the nations is so different now. And that will also come into play with uh, with our number two film. But it's just it's un it's unreal. And it, it shows up on HBO periodically. Hmm. Um, but it's uh, Musica Campesina country music uh, from Alberto Fuguet. And he's I think he's back in Chile now. But it just like real. I got to I got to talk to him briefly. I'm not in the film, sadly, but um, but I know some people who ended up in it, and it's just it's just an amazing little document, um, a very kind and unpretentious film. Mm-hmm. Um, number four is Make Out with Violence, which technically was made in Hendersonville, but it's a it's a a John Hughes undead kind. Um, teen party movie it's very it's like the, the, honestly what it reminds me of more than anything is the virgin suicides the mm-hmm. sofia coppola film i mean it's very much about how young life is and how things what, like as soon as you start dating or falling in love everything sort of acquires this operatic uh scale it's like you know the old phil specter records that were like you know they're like operas in two and a half minutes uh built around you know the the things that like the youth understand Mm -hmm. um is beautiful it's just an incredible film and it like it all it's it destroyed lives i mean it took them a while to get it done like the people who made it a lot of them don't talk to each other anymore relationships were furrowed families turned against each other so much drama behind it but if you see the film it's like it's an amazing portrait of young love and also southern communities in a really interesting way like diverse southern communities and um in a way that you don't normally see in like national releases Mm. um but yeah it's called make out with violence absolutely worth seeing um number three is nashville girl this is the trashiest sleaziest thing you would ever see it's from the 70s uh, roger corman put it out uh, it's directed by gus draconis it's about a young woman who just wants to be a country star she wants to get to nashville and become famous and it's it was the showgirls of its day like it is trashy and depraved and it, it got shown a few years back and people were shocked you know, like you, you would think that there nothing can shock this anymore. Wrong, <laughs> and it's um, it's uh, absolutely worth seeing. Like, if you want to, it's like no matter what horrifying story you have about this city, Nashville girl did it first. And uh, Joe Bob Briggs, the legendary driving critic, you know, he has a he has a whole thing about like the history of redneck cinema that he's actually going to be doing at the Bell Court on the twenty third of this month. But he talks about Nashville Girl, and like uh, uh, se- several of us got to talk to him and tell him, well, we showed that in Nashville, and he's just like, and you weren't run out of the city. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Bob Briggs is another uh, uh, like Harmony Corinne person who where, where mm-hmm. I saw him as a, in, in yeah. rural Maine. Ah. I was like, oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. These he's, people are out there. Yeah, he's such a singular <laughs> presence, and he's a Vandy grad, yeah. which I think is hysterical. Is that, is that right? He graduated from Vandy, oh, yes. He's, that, he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two is Gummo. Yeah. Uh, back to Harmony. And, like, th- here's the thing. A lot of, much like Nashville, our number one film, a lot of people really hate Gummo. But um, for, like, I I don't want to say my art school friends, but for, like, the people who became my best and closest friends, like, that film did a better job of bringing people to Nashville, like, weirdos, deviants, fuck-ups, uh, amazing artists, people who have changed the game behind the scenes. Like, that film was like a clarion call, and it's such a—it's distinctive, and it's not for everybody. And I know that, like, the making of that burnt a lot of local bridges, but it's like, when you watch it now— it feels like the closest thing that Middle Tennessee has ever gotten to something like Werner Herzog's Heart of Glass, mm. where it's just this, like, it's about a community, but warped and refracted. And, um, I mean, like, it's one of the few films that, like, that disgusts me in some aspects, but also I find, like, 
things of incredible beauty in it. And like that's again, you know, like that that the continuum of the Nashville experience, which is, you know, what, what Altman did effortlessly with his, uh, writers and, and cast and crew like that. There's something about Gummo. It's just like, you can hate it. I don't have a problem when people hate it, but when they try and dismiss it, I'm just like, Oh, you just, you just played yourself. You just tipped your hand to the fact that you don't really have any intelligent perceptions about this film. Mm. Um, you know, and it's just like, and it, maddens me to no end like but it, it's still it's like and, and that even more so than Musica Campesina like that documents like the west side of the city back in the 90s I mean like all that's the same anymore is Bobby's Dairy Dip that's really the only thing that's still exactly like that was then I mean even the roller skating rink is now an Aldi mm. it's like it's it's weird that like all these like moments that you know and that's that's what's amazing about film is that like yeah you can paint a picture of something and that's immor- immortality but with film with it moving with seeing people being part of it and you know and even more than that like the background people every one of these stories you could make a movie about every one of these people could be the subject of like something else but it's preserved you know 24 times a second on this like this little image, and I, I, I trip out on that. I mean, like that, Gummo is the kind of film that's going to make you trip out on things. And it's like, it's one of the things that Nashville cinema really excels at is just sort of like perspective. And again, it goes back to sort of like the idea of, you know, like for some people, fame is like the carrot that you're climbing for. And for some people, it's just like, it's just a random set of circumstances. And there's something about that. And I, you know, I don't even know if that's so much the case anymore, but it's part of the mentality of what I associate with the city that it's just like, like there's so many different possibilities with every single person that you meet. And New York's like that too, just because there's, you know, 6 million people. I'm sorry, 8 million people there. Where's my, where's my brain? But, um, but yeah, it's just like for such a Nashville is such a weird and fascinating place. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always going to be dear to my heart. I'm always going to be a Tennessean. Like, again, like I was complaining about the legislature other earlier that there's so many things that are frustrating for, um, good socially minded people who are about equality and stuff. But it's like, you know, this is my home. I'm not, I'm not leaving. Like I will, the, these, uh, these, uh, see, I'm not, I'm, starting to get fired up. So I'm just, but no, it's just like I, these people who are just like trying to put their like racist, dominionist, homophobic agenda and things. I'm just like, you know what? I'll outlive you. (laughs) I mean, now granted society, everything's on fire now and it's, it's all a big mess on, on a nationwide level. Um, well, and then also in Brazil and like you, you got dictators of choice all over the place, but it's like, I still, there's a certain kind of, like obstinate optimism at the base of my heart. And that's Haven Hamilton. That's when he's just like that. You can't do that here. This isn't Dallas. This is Nashville. And I'm just like, God damn right. (laughs) God damn right. Haven Hamilton. And also it's funny that this all started with nine to five, because like one of the things that like it, someone should create a letterbox list for, but that, that Nashville and uh, nine to five have in common. Well, it's, it's not Nashville per se, but like, in nine to five, you've got Lily Tomlin having to deal with Sterling Hayden as the chairman of the board. But in uh, Altman's film, The Long Goodbye, Henry Gibson mm-hmm. like slaps the shit out of Sterling Hayden as like the washed up alcoholic thing. And I just, I just like the idea that like there's something about people like, like, um, taking Sterling Hayden down a peg in these films. And that's just, that's what I associate it. Like when, as soon as I see Henry Gibson, it's like laughing is like number two, because number one, it's like, yes, slap, slap Sterling Hayden in the face, you know, take him down, Lily. That's <laughs> Lily Tomlin to this day is the only time I've ever gotten. That's not true. Okay. Nicole Kidman, you get starstruck around her um, yeah. the first time. And then you're just like, oh, she's a Nashvilleian. Mm-hmm. She's Nashville's most beloved movie star because she did it before it was cool. And, um, you know, and people protect her. And I love that. I love the fact that this city is just like, no, no, no. Nicole is cool. Nobody mess with her. Mm-hmm. But, um, 
the only time I've ever really gotten starstruck was uh, Lily Tomlin. Yeah. She came by my day job once, and I was just like, keep your shit together, Jason. And I was totally like, I was like, like sweating and just like, I mean, because like, you know, someone growing up with someone is like your comedic icon who helped shape your sense of what comedy is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I did not hang on to my cool that day. And, but did it with, and did it with justice in mind and did it with humor. Mm-hmm. Was not Absolutely. humorless about protecting yeah. the things that we hold dear. Yeah, it's great. The nine to five. If, if you haven't watched, if the, this podcast, obviously you should be familiar with Nashville, but yeah, give give nine to five a shot because it's if you haven't watched it in a while, it holds up. Yeah, the two people I went with, they hadn't seen it and they didn't uh-huh. know what to expect, and they were they were mm-hmm. uh, honestly and sincerely wowed by how <laughs> not just not just how righteous it is in the ways that you describe it. It's a good. It's a funny movie. It is. It is, and the jokes still hold up. <laughs> and um, you know, and even even. Even when the jokes are built around like having to acknowledge some very difficult truths about the workplace and the way that that men and women treat each other, it's still like it's it's a classic. <laughs> Jason, thank you just is so much for putting together Absolutely. this list and talking about these things and doing what you do. I'm happy to anytime. I will be on any podcast that asks, so thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Awesome. Well, I hope you have a great day. Indeed, you as well. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Nashville Demystified. Thanks to Jesse LaFontaine for all things related to sound post-production. Uh, all the music in this episode is by all sorts of uh, folks and sources, and you can find that on the website. Hope you do. Hey, every episode has a show-specific illustration provided by my long-time friend and wonderful illustrator, Tim Burns. They're pretty great. I hope you'll check those out as well. Um, In the coming weeks, we're going to talk about all sorts of issues. Uh, Black history, queer history, comedy, more about film, um, and on and on. I hope you'll follow us in all of the places you can do that and subscribe. Uh, Do those things. It really does help. Thanks for everything. Nashville Demystified, again, is presented by Knack Factory, and we own this town. All right, y'all. Have a good day.